Hello, you join me on top of St George's Down near the centre of the island. Down there is Merston and God's Hill. Newport is about three miles that way and down there is the quaint historical village of Arreton. It is a stunning part of the island's landscape but its beauty masks a dark and gruesome tale. I'm Eleanor and this is the story of a vicious killer. This is the story of Michael Morey. This part of the island is fairly unsuspecting, picturesque and reminiscent of a past age. If you ignore the main road of course. Arreton though, for all its charm, has sinister stories to hide. One of which is the gruesome murder of a 14 year old boy called James at the hands of his grandfather Michael. It is not known when exactly Michael was born. But what we do know is that he was baptised very young here at St George's Church in Arreton on the 21st of April, 1672. He grew up in the area and in his late teens showed an interest in woodcutting, establishing himself in the profession. His first child, Mary, was born in 1696. She was the first of six children and baptised in the same church as Michael. Not much is known about Mary's early life. What is almost certain though, is that she lived and grew up with her parents in their small home in the area just up the road called Sulland. She got married in 1718 to a man by the name of Thomas Dove. The pair lived at Sulland with Michael and his extended family. Then Mary gave birth on the 13th of May 1722, at the age of 26. Tragically though, she died during childbirth, much to the devastation of the family. And for a while, Thomas and his newborn son, named James, continued to live at the residence following the death of the child's mother. Michael also had five other children, though much like his wife, not much is documented about them. Times began to grow hard at Sullins, Woodcutting wasn't the most lavish of professions, and money was tight. But no one knew how desperate things would become. Desperate enough to kill. Despite a lack of major income, Michael continued in his trade, perhaps feeling it was the only job he knew he could do well. Winters passed, and as time went on, Thomas found a new love. This prompted him to make a rather short-sighted decision. And now this is where things get a little, well, hazy. Thomas Dove remarried in 1727 and left little James behind in the care of his grandfather at Sullins. Michael decided to raise the boy as any grandfather should, but it is unknown what happened behind closed doors. The hazy part of the story centers around this time James was young and no longer under the supervision of his father. There are accounts that suggest that Michael abused James, perhaps blaming the small child for the death of Mary. Now in his 60s, he was becoming frail and struggling to put food on the table. It is because of this, it is believed that one more motive to kill revealed itself. It is thought that when James reached a certain age, he would inherit a sum of money left to him by his dearly departed mother. Now it can't be said whether this is truth or whether this is a feeble justification for what Michael was planning to do. Either way, Michael was becoming desperate and decided to hatch a plan. He decided he was going to kill his grandson. But how? Michael knew the woods would be the perfect place. He knew them well. It was June 1736 and the foliage was thick. The perfect time to camouflage the unlawful act. James was now 14 and much of what he did know about the world was from his grandfather 
So to him, walking into the woods with Michael was nothing out of the ordinary. Months passed and winter became spring. James would regularly accompany Michael on trips to the local town of Newport to collect goods passing through the woods on the way. Soon though, a seemingly normal walk through the woods with his grandfather would for James be his last. The day of the murder started like any other. James shadowing his grandfather on a journey to the town with a billhook and a pair of leather panniers to carry the goods, away from the safety of Salons and towards the woods. Once they were in a secluded part of the area, Michael took his billhook and in a merciless attack, slashed James repeatedly again and again till his grandson lay bloody and lifeless on the ground. Michael then continued to hack at his grandson's bloody corpse. But just what was going through his mind? As a woodsman, he knew that the smell of a rotting corpse would attract the attention of the local wildlife. Therefore, the only way to hide his crime was by hacking his grandson into pieces, stuffing him in the panniers and burying him in the ground. Time passed by, and although Michael was held under house arrest on suspicion of his crime, no body had yet been found, so murder could not be proven. This all changed though with the weather, and as autumn moved into winter, the foliage thinned out, and one day a man called Richard Norris was trekking through the woods. And suddenly he came across what could only be described is a stuff of nightmares. A rotten, dismembered, maggot-laced corpse. And after analysing the torn blood-soaked clothes, there was no doubt. It was James. The small hope that James may still have been alive and perhaps run away had been extinguished in the most horrific way possible. Upon analysing the gruesome extent of the larvae infestation, it was concluded that James had been dead for some time, placing the time of the murder at the beginning of the summer when Michael had first come under suspicion. James was buried in Areton, in the churchyard where his grandfather and mother had been baptised. Michael was then moved to Winchester Gaul to wait for trial. There he resided until the spring of 1737. On the 19th of March, Michael was put on trial. The evidence was overwhelming and the sentence, of course, was death. He was taken to the gallows on the hilltop of Winchester and without a word of remorse, the trap door was pulled from under Michael's feet. Shortly after the hanging, his body was transported back to the island. A post was then embedded in an ancient burrow on the hilltop above the village where Michael's corpse was then hung from a gibbet encased in chains and covered in a tar-like substance to make sure his corpse would rot for longer. And this is where it stood, embedded in the burrow high above the village of Areton. Although the burrow dates back to the Bronze Age, it would become known as Michael Morey's Hump. Over the next 200 or so years, various archaeological excavations have taken place on the site, one of which took place in 1933. And on this occasion, a skull was uncovered which was thought to be Michael's. Although further evidence suggests that the skull may not be that of Michael, instead belonging to a prehistoric citizen. And the fact that the skull is in good condition could suggest of a later burial. And luckily for us, it still exists, quite conveniently, at a local pub. At the Hare and Hound, artefacts from the Michael Morey case are on display to the public, including part of the beam which supported the gibbet and the skull in question. 
Michael Mori, he is dead for chopping off his grandson's head. He is hung on Arrington Down for rooks and ravens to peck him down. And that was the murderous tale of Michael Mori. If you enjoyed our videos, please subscribe to our channel for more gruesome tales of the Isle of Wight. But for now, all this talk of blood is making me thirsty.